Hi everybody, it's week four of the course, and this week, as you notice, I have you do some readings about the foundings or the origins of the American state. So I want to give this lecture that uh, really supplements the readings, and I'd like you to do the readings, realizing uh, I'm asking you to read three of the Federalist Papers, three of about 95 of the Federalist Papers. I also realize that the Federalist Papers are not the easiest reads in the world, and you might have to read each a couple of times. Um, I really think that a copy of the Federalist Papers is something that every uh, public administration scholar ought to have in her library. You know, the reason I say that is because it really does go back to foundings. And we're going to talk about this a little more in depth within the next few weeks. But this idea of constitutional foundings of the American state is very important. I give this lecture with a little bit of trepidation because I am certainly not a constitutional scholar. I am not a lawyer by any means. But, I, but I'm a believer that the, the Constitution does have uh, foundational purpose. And I, I go along with the late Professor John Rohr of Virginia Tech, who, who really stressed that during his entire academic career of spanning about 50 years, that the Constitution is important as a founding event. And if you read anything that Professor Rohr writes, that's how he refers to the Constitution. Not necessarily as a founding document, it is that, but as a founding event. In other words, the entire uh, event had to do with not just writing the document in the summer of 1787, that is what happened historically, but also the Federalist Papers. And Rohr would even stretch that out to the past 200 and, you know, 40 years of American existence, 230 years, and, and uh, talk about things like Supreme Court decisions as being part of this sort of ongoing uh, ex exploration of American democracy. So I want to give this lecture that supplements your readings and um, hopefully this will aid in your understanding of what you're reading this week. I also want to give you um, a couple of a couple of reminders. The first one is that the scholarly book review proposal is due, as noted here, which is in week five. So uh, please do see the syllabus and the week five module for further instruction on how to submit that proposal. And again, if you have any questions on that, please do email me um, in advance and I will gladly uh, correspond with you on your questions. And then for this week, for week four, there's no discussion, but your first journal, which is actually your your end of unit one summary, is going to be due. Uh, you'll be able to link to the journal on the week four module. Okay, I, I actually want to take a little bit of a diversion uh, for two slides here. And because I thought this was an opportune time to do this in this course, since 8050 and 8090 are really about the first two courses that any of our MPA or other graduate students take, um, it's really important that you get off on the right foot in terms of research. Now, for your scholarly book review project, you notice, reading the syllabus, which we went over, you notice that the scholarly book review project is not a book report, as in, I read Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar is killed by Brutus, the end. I mean, that's a book report, right? In the scholarly book review, you are you are reporting on what the book says, but you're also actually situating the book in public administration thought. So I've asked you to use other sources in your scholarly book review, as you know. So one of the issues with sources is there's all kinds of different sources and by the time you're a graduate student uh, you should actually have a handle on a lot of this um, but just in case there's any misunderstanding uh, 
I categorized several different types of research sources here. And, and these two charts uh, on the next, this slide and the next slide are actually useful for all your reports, not just in this class. So uh, in the left-hand column, I have type of source, and then I have pros and cons in the middle column, and then when to use in the, the right column. So in the left column, you see the first one I list are sources like Wikipedia, ask.com, wikihow, investopedia, things like that. Okay, so these actually are not terribly bad. I mean, of course, you've had instructors who said, I never want to see a, a reference to Wikipedia, and I don't want to see a reference to Wikipedia. But I, I tell you, when I do use Wikipedia, um, it actually gives you a little bit of information on a topic, and at the bottom, it gives you some sources. So it's actually a pretty good uh, source for um, just starting to look at a topic and then moving on from there, just with the sources. I, I certainly wouldn't quote from Wikipedia or Investopedia or anything like that, but but really for a quick definition or just to put something in your head, they're really not bad. The second thing is um, personal websites and blogs. So honestly, I would say in the right-hand column, if you notice that, um, I'd tell you to almost never use those um, because it's really just that person's opinion, right? And that person might not even be using their real name. It might be some pseudonym. And so really a blog is just as good as that person's opinion. And so therefore I wouldn't cite a blog. Um, and then there's, now we're getting into things that are getting a little more tricky, like organizations with obvious biases, like front page mag.com jezebel.com um these are these are sources that take news items and then sort of put a, a a lot of spin on it and i would almost never use those kinds of sources okay then we get to mainline journalistic sources like um, mainline news organizations like broadcast news or online or newspapers like the new york times washington post omaha world herald um those are great Using journalistic sources is just fine. Uh, understand they're not scholarly sources, but journalistic sources are, are good to use, especially mainline kind of journalistic sources. Do recognize the difference between opinion, an opinion piece and a report. That's used to be easier to spot in a newspaper, right? Newspapers were about reporting. It's also true that newspapers do have their own editorial bias in even in their reporting. However, it was always pretty clear that you're reading an editorial in a traditional newspaper because it was on the editorial page. Now that's not so easy online. I mean, you can read a piece from even mainline sources and not realize you're reading an opinion piece. So understand the difference between an opinion piece and a report on something. Um, and then we move on to things like trade and professional journals. So things like nonprofit times, advancing philanthropy, emergency management. These are good to understand the pulse really of a profession. What you have to understand about the articles that trade journals typically publish, sometimes they're, um, they consolidate a lot of uh, different things. They might, for example, consolidate a lot of scholarly work into an article so lots of times the it's not original research but it's it's sort of a, a reader's digest version lots of times of of research but they're not bad and especially in a profession you probably should be reading those um, in your profession and then we move on to things like think tanks and other policy study organizations like rand heritage center for american progress i threw the three of those in there on purpose because um Heritage, Heritage Foundation takes what is uh, typically known as a very conservative view of the world. Center for American Progress takes what is typically known as a very liberal view of the world. And RAND in California is actually sort of nonpartisan. So think tanks, you know, travel on this spectrum from right to left nonpartisan in the middle. Some of them are bipartisan, as a matter of fact. They purposely have uh, boards and scholars who are Republicans and Democrats, but you have to be diligent to understand their perspective. In fact, most think tanks really use basic sets of facts 
Um, but what they do with those facts is very different. So, you know, a great experiment would be look up a, a topic, a policy topic, for example, like Social Security, and see how it's handled by these various different um, kinds of think tanks uh, in on their websites. And you can kind of see a little bit different perspective. Um, and then there's scholarly journals like Public Administration Review, Journal of Public Administration Research, Journal of Nonprofit Management, International Journal of Emergency Management. The thing that sets scholarly journals apart is the peer review process. So what that means, what's the peer review process mean? That means that data and methodology are reviewed and critiqued. They're reviewed and critiqued by typically by professors. Um, I have reviewed journal articles. The, the review is anonymous. And if you're trying to get an article published, you get comments back critiquing, sometimes in fairly stark terms, your methodology and um, your literature review, for example. Um, the, the great thing about these is because of the peer review process, they're generally, the research is, is fairly well substantiated. The other great thing about a journal article is that it gives you a great list of references. So getting to your scholarly book review project, you know, a lot of people might comment about a book, especially if it's kind of a classic book. And you can look that you can connect a lot of those references together and those will lead you to other references and those will lead you to other references. So that's an idea of how you start understanding the literature you know, surrounding a topic, for example, because you start looking at those references and it builds a little bit of a web that you can start visibly seeing surrounding that topic. So that is the, just those two slides. That's a diversion from this week, but it's an important one because it's important to understand differences in kinds of sources. Okay, so let me get to the meat of this week's lecture. So the issue this week really is tension because American democracy is founded on tension. It's not founded on efficiency. It's not founded on the quickest way to get policy passed. It's founded on tension. So what are these tensions? And I think you'll get to see what I mean as we move through this, but what are some of these tensions? Well, originally one of the really, one of the really original tensions in our democracy is classical republicanism versus classical liberalism. But what are those two things? Because the meanings have sort of changed of those words. So classical republicanism means that that society is valued over the individual. And we value participation by virtuous and involved citizens in the institutions of governance. Right. So that does beg a question as to who are the citizens, because it is true that when our nation was founded, um, not everyone was a citizen and not everyone had the rights of citizenship. So women couldn't vote. African-Americans certainly couldn't vote because most of them were enslaved. Uh, Native Americans couldn't vote. So, um, so that question is begged there in classical republicanism. But in general, what it means is that uh, we value participation. And that really is in tension with classical liberalism, which, which favors individual autonomy. You know, when Jefferson was talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that was really kind of a classical liberalism sort of view. Um, so we, so you can see that both those things really are important in American democracy because they both get talked about, right? In classical liberalism, we worry about what is the cost to the dispossessed, right? So I as an individual have the, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of, pursuit of happiness. But, you know, when those words were, were written, was Jefferson talking about everybody, right? So the point is that those two things are in tension with each other, and each of them has a couple of what ifs associated with them. And another tension is procedural democracy versus substantive democracy. So really, really procedural democracy is our structure. And the Constitution sets up structure of governance. Now, all constitutions set up structure of governance, not just our national constitution, but our state constitutions, our city charters. They set up the structure of governance. So in procedural democracy, 
we give people theoretically equal rights to participate. So if the city council has a meeting and by their rules, say they use Robert's rules of order or some other rule of order, there's always a time at the end of the meeting where the public has a right to participate, make statements. The public has a right to come when there's specific agenda items, right? In our democracy, we give people the right to vote. And so um, this has come up in 2016, right? Um, what, what do we do about the right to vote? What we do about the right to vote, what we've been fairly careful about is structuring the voting system so that people can be given that right to vote. We still have breakdowns. We are certainly better than we were in 1960. We are certainly better than we were in 1860. But, but procedural democracy is setting up the structure that theoretically guarantees equality of participation. Substantive democracy means we actually think about things like trying to uh, level out inequalities of wealth, power, and privilege. Do we do that across the board? No, a lot of people uh, would say that we need to do more of that. A lot of people would say we need to do less of that. And this is where we get into arguments. But again, here's a tension in our democracy. A third tension is representative democracy versus direct democracy, right? So we have a representative democracy. Our country was never designed to be a direct democracy. Of course, we do have this, the, you know, the classic New England town hall meeting where everybody from town shows up, everybody votes on the issues and they proceed with that democracy. We don't have a town hall system in the United States government. We don't have a town hall system in um, our states or our cities. We have representative democracy. So we elect officials to represent us. Now, uh, we often get upset about that, right? We say they don't represent my view. They don't represent the people. And that might be true, in fact, but the fact of the matter is they're not elected because they're going to poll you on every issue. They might, but but in fact, most of the time, they're going to vote on their own conscience. And that is in opposition to direct democracy, as in the New England town hall meeting. So that's a third tension in American democracy. There are more tensions in American democracy, vertical and horizontal. So what are the vertical tensions in American democracy? Well, the vertical tensions in American democracy were set up by the Constitution. We live in a federalist nation. That means that governmental power is shared between the national government and state governments. Now we say it's shared by city governments, but in fact, it's important to realize that cities appear nowhere in the constitution, only the national government and state governments. But there is still tension between these three levels of government, right? And there's different ways of modeling how that, how that tension plays out. And there's these three uh, circle charts here from Wright in 1988 that show different views of how that federalism is supposed to work. On the far left, you have the national government on top, state governments on the bottom, with local governments completely subsumed by state governments. Because in fact, legally, cities are creatures of the states that they reside in. Um, and so that's a hierarchy. You can see that clearly that's a hierarchy with the national government taking precedence. And then we have these kind of these circles that are nesting in the middle diagram, right? So the local government has issues it's concerned about. The state government is also concerned about those issues, but has more issues that it's concerned about. And then the national government is concerned about those issues and other issues beyond that. So this kind of nested democracy is a model there. And then there's this interlocking circle, kind of like a Venn diagram on the far right. Right, so the point is that each level has issues of concern and at some point they interlock. And where they interlock depends on the issue. So these three models really demonstrate that we have tension because of course, the, the specific relationship between the national government, the states and the cities is not necessarily spelled out uh, explicitly in the constitution. And so we depend on changing circumstances 
we depend on the issue. We even depend on court cases to actually help us define that relationship. And then, of course, there's the horizontal relationship tensions. And we're most familiar with this, right? We know there's a tension between the executive and the legislative and the judicial. And so this plays out really both at the national level and the state level. You know, at, at the state level, for example, the governor is the executive. There is a legislature in every state. And of course, there's always tension between the executive and the legislative at the state level and at the national level. But at the state level, it really revolves around budget making for the most part. Um, and even at the state level, there there's typically a state Supreme Court, which can rule laws unconstitutional, just as our U.S. Supreme Court can do for U.S. laws. And so in the current presidency or even the past presidency or any presidency, we've seen tension between the three branches of government. Right. And we see that that uh, Congress often says that the president is usurping the powers of Congress. We often see that presidents say that the legislator, the, the Congress is doing not enough. And so this tension exists, and this tension really is built into the Constitution specifically. Um, so where does administration fit in? And, you know, what about this politics administration dichotomy? We're going to hopefully kind of get to that. Um, if not this week, again, it's something that we continue to worry about. So I want to give you for the next few slides kind of a constitutional chronology only because everybody talks about the Constitution. Not that many people read it and certainly far fewer people read any of the Federalist Papers. So the fact that you're reading three of the Federalist Papers this week, you probably have read more of the Federalist Papers than 95 percent of the citizenry of the United States. So a few things about the Constitution. It is the oldest written national constitution still in force. I mean, it was a trendsetter, right? The British Constitution, what is referred to as the British Constitution is not one written document. Um, how it came about is that elites were divided on the need to create a stronger constitutional structure. And so the Constitutional Convention of 1787, when it finally was called, was called to improve the relationships among the states. And that is where really we get this line in the preamble in order to form a more perfect union. So it did design a federal system with limited delegated and enumerated powers to the central government, that is the national government, and the remainder to the states. It did implement the principle of government by consent. So the constitution had to be ratified. That was the consent of the governed to fall under the Constitution. And finally, it was advocated by people like Madison and Hamilton, who believed that the previous Constitution, if you will, the Articles of Confederation, were ineffective and weak. And so from the Kerry and McClellan text, which I cite here, but I don't make you read, um, the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union was the, actually the Articles of Confederation. And what they posit is that that was really more like a, uh, a kind of a treaty versus a constitution. Um, power was vested in Congress. There really was no real executive. There was a president of the Congress, but that was really the presiding officer. There really was no national judicial function. So really it was simply a Congress which required unanimous consent of all the states on most actions. Um, one of the things that led to a constitutional convention is there was actually a crisis which happened to be that crisis happened to be the idea that congress couldn't pay members of the continental army some hadn't been paid in years um, there was a previous attempt in 1786 uh, that only five states attended ironically it was in annapolis and the state of maryland did didn't attend um, but that Congress actually led to the Continental Congress agreeing that there should be a, a constitutional convention in 1787. So when we go to the constitutional convention, what were they talking about? Um, they're talking about some really important things that which, which led to our constitution because, you know, what came out of the constitutional convention certainly wasn't foreordained that the structure that 
that came out was what everybody had in mind. Um, the state of Virginia, which was heavily influenced by Madison, really proposed that um, larger states would be represented heavier, right? So in our, in our uh, House of Representatives, every state is represented proportionally. So some states like Alaska with a, a small population only has one <laughs> member of Congress. Some states like uh, California have, I don't know, 30. Um, Nebraska has three. So the Virginia plan really was this idea that there should be uh, a legislature that's formed on the basis of proportionality. The New Jersey plan was something like what already existed, and that was that each state should be um, represented by representatives per state one representative per state or two representative per states. Well, what we call the great compromise of the Constitutional Convention was the creation of two houses, the House of Representatives with proportional representation and the Senate with equal representation per state. And so after the Constitutional Convention and the Constitution was written, it did not become automatically the law of the land. It had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. So in order to basically sell ratification, Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay, but primarily Hamilton and Madison wrote the Federalist Papers. They didn't write them all at once. The Federalist Papers were really what we would call um, editorials. And they were mostly published in New York newspapers for the express purpose of influencing the ratification Congress in in the state of New York. Uh, the people who who advocated the adoption of the Constitution called themselves Federalists. The people who advocated not adopting the Constitution were called Anti-Federalists. It doesn't mean they left the country as soon as the Constitution was passed. Uh, far from it, many of them continued to serve in Congress. But the the, the people who advocated the adoption of the Constitution knew that without the states of New York and Virginia, even if nine other states uh, ratified the Constitution, that the Union wouldn't survive with the two largest states. So these editorials were written to really address different kinds of topics, and they did this over several months. So here's some of the topics they addressed. National security, wherein they talk about the role of a national army and a navy versus militias. Democratic versus Republican government, right? So that is direct democracy versus election of, of representatives. Bicameralism versus unicameralism. Direct elections versus indirect elections. Participation in the political process. Um, factions that were evident, you know, North versus South, slave versus free states, manufacturing versus agricultural states. They talked about separation of powers the power of each branch. They talked about the presidency, how the president was elected. What's the power of the president with reference to Congress? They talked about Congress, how the Congress was elected. They talked about the judiciary and how it's appointed. So in other words, what the Federalist Papers serve to do is, is operate as something like uh, an owner's manual or an explanatory document explaining what the people who actually wrote the Constitution were thinking on each of these topics. And that is why, in fact, it's important to look at the Federalist Papers. Okay, so here's from the Kerry and McClellan text. There's several parts to the Federalist Papers. And, and the, actually they were written somewhat in this chronological order. So part one is the advantages of a more perfect union, right? So here are the advantages of a more perfect union that Madison and Hamilton said this is why we need this national constitution. And you can read those points there. Um, but these really are the points that uh, are important to the furtherance of the American state. So for example, uh, they argued that, that a constitutional republic would provide greater national security. In other words, instead of Virginia and New York and North Carolina and Massachusetts, all separately dealing with the 
clear military threat, which was mostly an, a sea threat from Great Britain, uh, that would be done as one country, right? They said that a constitution would provide commercial advantages of one country vis-a-vis -vis the European nations. Uh, they said that it would help to normalize tax taxes in the forms of duties and tariffs. So if, if goods were being imported to uh, the port of Charleston, the, the duty imports would be the same as if they were being imported to the, the port of New York. So they said, you know, we're better together than we are apart. That was that. The second part was the weaknesses of the existing confederation. And they didn't, really didn't have to try too hard to do this because it was weak. Um, because the Articles of Confederation were like a committee wherein everybody on the committee had to be in favor of an action for it to happen. Otherwise, there was no consensus. Um, so really, they said, you know, under the Articles of Confederation, the national government is unable to compel the states to do anything at all. I mean, that taxes, raising a militia, there is no, there is no coercion power of the national government. Part three was the powers exercised by the national government. And this is actually where we start having more tensions with each other. So what does the national government do? What do state governments do, right? One of the primary ones that at that time that the national government assumed was common defense. So there really wasn't a question in the constitution that um, the military establishment was a function of the national government. Curiously, in some of the Federalist Papers, uh, Hamilton and Madison do talk about what happens if a tyrant assumes control of the national government and the national military establishment. They argued that the states would be able to resist that with their militias. Now, is that true today? Um, I kind of doubt it, but they um really felt that that was the case then um they did not think that uh that would happen they they argued that it probably wouldn't happen what they seemed to fear more in the federalist papers was the idea that without a national defense establishment um states would take it upon themselves to uh act militarily and they could even act against each other. The last thing that they talked about which was important was this idea that the national government has taxation powers and the states have taxation powers but they're different kinds of taxation. They did probably did not envision an income tax. What they saw as the primary taxing power of the national government were duties and tariffs. So those are their arguments about exer uh, powers exercised by the national government. Um, part four was really making an argument against the Anti-Federalists, which says, um, why, does, why does the Constitution conform with the principles of republicanism, right? Because the Anti-Federalists said it really doesn't conform with that. Um, what they were really making an argument on was they said the states still do retain the largest amount of power. That was their argument. Now, you can argue that might not be true today, but that was their argument in the Federalist Papers. Um, they, they argued that the separation of powers between branches of government prevents tyranny by one, and that is an important argument that they make in this part. And you're going to be reading uh, Federalist 51. That is a very important argument to the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, be because the Anti-Federalists and others feared a strong executive, a, a, mon a monarchical kind of executive. Um, they said that the presidential election assures uh, the election of only qualified individuals, that he can be impeached, unlike a king who really probably can't be removed without some violence. Um, and so really what they were saying was, look, this is a stronger central government, but it's not so strong that, we'll, that it will overpower every other government. And so here's some features of the Constitution. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of people speak of the Constitution as if, um, well, as if Moses brought it down 
you know, with the Ten Commandments from the mountain. And I'm not trying to belittle that, but what I'm saying is that the Constitution that a lot of people reference is probably not the Constitution uh, that we see today. So lest we forget, you know, the House of Representatives, the proportional part of the House of Representatives included something that is infamous, the three-fifths clause, which counted each person in bondage as three-fifths of a person. Now, um, th does that mean that they thought that each slave was only worth three-fifths of a person? Well, probably, and actually they probably thought less of people in bondage, truth be told, but what that really did was it gave more representation to slave states because states like South Carolina with a lot of slaves got more representation in the House of Representatives than states that didn't have a lot of slaves. Um, the Senate was elected indirectly by state legislatures. So we're used to electing senators today. That wasn't the case originally. They were appointed actually. The president was designed to be indirectly elected by electors. Um, and those, how did those electors get appointed? Those electors mostly got appointed by state legislatures, not by voters necessarily. That changed rather quickly actually when voters started voting for electors, but but it, originally it was an indirect election of the president. The, the office of the vice president mentioned in article one and article two, there's really no jobs given to the vice president except president of the Senate and becoming president should the president become unable to serve. Well, um, so one of the things happened that happened precedent wise was John Adams hated the job of vice president. And so he really didn't spend much time in the Senate. But what if Adams had really enjoyed the job of vice president and had become something like the spokesperson for the Senate and established that precedent? What would have happened in the future? Um, would we have had a prime minister as in a vice president and a president? Uh, it's open to question. Um, the Supreme Court was appointed by a president with advice uh, and consent of the Senate, just like now. But there really was no actual judicial review. That's not in the Constitution. Um, that was actually invented by John Marshall. So there was no Bill of Rights yet when the Constitution was written. That came about during the first Congress. Um, and the federal government really had weak taxation rights with the assumption that states would do most of the taxing. So the idea is, you know, what the Constitution really is a symbol to us, but it's more than a symbol. It really is a document that guides the structure of our government, right? And because nearly every Supreme Court case that is decided has to do with something being constitutional. That is, does this law or this action by the president or Congress, is it constitutional? Is it in conformance with the Constitution? Um, so the key really to the Constitution is this idea of separation of powers. Um, and, and again, that is what Federalist 51 is laying out. I mean, primarily it's a legislative executive separation of powers, but there is judicial power. And so all three branches have power uh, over each other. And there is a national state separation. So um, there's a, an author, Meyerson, I don't have you read him either, but he talks about the idea of that there's a school of thought called partial originalism. I'm not necessarily advocating it um, because people argue about should we take the Constitution literally and originally, or should we take it partially, or how should we take the Constitution in court cases? So I use the example of um, military issues because most of us uh, in this class, all of us, as a matter of fact, have grown up knowing that there's some big department in the federal government called the Department of Defense. Well, there wasn't always a Department of Defense. As a matter of fact, forming something called a Department of Defense would probably be quite scary to Hamilton and Madison. Hamilton argued that the Navy, the job of the Navy was to protect commerce. Uh, they, they both argued that the job of the Army was to serve as a militia, to secure the borders against the Indian tribes who they got into regular skirmishes with and to secure it against the British and the French who really had forts uh, in the Ohio area uh, and threatened the United States. So in the original constitution, there was a separate army and Navy. Um, 
post-1947, there was a National Security Act uh, of 1947 that formed a Department of Defense. Some people would argue that that really would have required a constitutional amendment, but there wasn't one. Um, so there are several Federalist Papers that talk about what the Navy's supposed to do. You can see that uh, 11 and 24. Um, in Federalist 22, 23, 26, 27, 41, and 46, there's discussion of the separation between provisioning and command. Um, in Federalist 28 and 74, um, it talks about national armies being more safer, safer really, than, than state militias. And then Federal 69, there is an emphasis on the limits of the presidential role. In fact, the the Congress, the way the the way the Constitution is written, Congress was really supposed to be supreme over the military, and the president was only supposed to be commander in chief during times of war. We've sort of reversed that, right? We we routinely call the president the commander in chief, even when we're not talking about the military. Um, we now know that the president suggests uh, submits the budget for the entire Department of Defense. Of course, yes, the Congress does have to approve the budget. And working with the president's budget is still one of the very important powers of Congress. Um, but again, Congress really works to approve or disapprove or modify the president's budget. When the Constitution was written, there was a two-year budget which the Congress had a lot of influence on, perhaps more than the president. So what has changed? Has the Constitution changed? No, you know, the Constitution has not changed. What has changed is precedent. What has changed are circumstances. So this is just really kind of one example of what Meyerson is arguing about in, with this idea of partial originalism. Um, there are other points of view on that. There are plenty of other points of view on that. And again, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but um, I will tell you that um, it seems clear that to me that that circumstances have changed. And if we try to go back and look at the Constitution, we have to look at it in context, certainly. And we're going to get to more of that in a couple of weeks when we start. Uh, I'm going to have you look at some readings that talk about legitimacy of administration and the Constitution. So that's it for this lecture. Um, here's my references. and. I'd like you to, uh, again, we have the, the journal this week. Um, no discussion this week, so I'm looking forward. I just want to show you that last page of references. I'm looking forward to your journal entries. Thanks.